Welcome everybody to uh, the PeerView Genital Urinary Cancer ASCO G uh, Satellite Symposium. The symposium title is Strengthening Our Grip on Immuno-Oncology in Genital Urinary Cancers, Understanding Science Through Stories. Thank you for everyone in the room who's decided to come and spend an hour or two here with us. My name is Jonathan Rosenberg. I'm a medical oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Joining me for this PeerView Live Symposium are Dr. Hans Hammers from the UT Southwestern Medical Center and Dr. Ravi Madan from the National Cancer Institute. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerview.com forward slash XZX. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. So now we're ready to get started. I'm going to start with a brief overview of the uh, current past and future of immunotherapy. We'll move to the discussion of optimal decision-making in kidney cancer, um, focus on bladder cancer after that, um, and then prostate cancer, what's on the horizon, and have time for conclusions and Q&A. So immune checkpoint blockading cancer has now become established as, a, as an important therapy for patients in many different diseases. Um, and this is based on the fact that tumor cells can hide from and inhibit the body's immune responses by binding to proteins such as PD-1 um, on the surface of T cells. And that antibody therapies that block this binding reactivate the immune response. And we see here in these diagrams that the T cell receptor recognizes the tumor cell. PD-L1 binds PD-1, inhibits the T cell response. But if antibodies block this interaction, um, they separate the ligand from the receptor and actually reactivate and reinvigorate the immune response in a subset of patients. So there is a balance between activation and inhibition of T cells in the body. If all T cells were active at once, um, you would have raging autoimmunity. Um, and if they're all inhibited, you would have no ability to react to um, stimuli against the immune system. And we see here um, both activating receptors and inhibitory receptors. Um, examples of activating receptors um, include OX40, uh, GITR, CD27, and inhibitory receptors that are being targeted therapeutically today, CTLA-4 and PD-1, and experimental inhibitors. Changes in the balance lead to differences in T-cell stimulation and activation. So there are multiple different steps that are required to initiate and sustain an anti-tumor immune response. Um, and this is a figure that uh, talks about what's been called the cancer immunity cycle, um, where you start with the release of antigens. Those antigens are presented to the immune system. The T cells are then primed. The T cells have to get to the tumors. They have to infiltrate inside the tumors once they get to the tumors. They actually have to recognize that the tumor cells are bad, and then they can move ahead with killing cancer cells in order to establish this response. So there's multiple different mechanisms that are at play here. Um, from the start of the immune response to the end of result, which is a dead cancer cell. In multiple different cancer types, um, we've seen that mutation burden may play a role in whether or not the, tumor actual, the tumors are sensitive or the degree of sensitivity uh, to immune checkpoint blockade. Here we see um, an array of different uh, solid tumors um, from, uh, ranging from a very low mutation burden um, to tumors with the highest mutation burden, such as melanoma. Um, the tumors that tend to be the most sensitive to immunotherapy on average are on the higher end of the spectrum with bladder cancer here. Kidney cancer has a modest amount of mutations, um, yet still is sensitive to immunotherapy and probably mechanisms well beyond mutation load, while prostate cancer is on the low end of the spectrum and may explain at least some of the reason why prostate cancer to date has not been exquisitely immunosensitive to PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibition. And so when we look at the numbers of mutations versus the response rate, here you see the overjective response rate with PDL1 and PD1 inhibition, and the frequency of somatic mutations. The highest mutation load and the highest response are things like melanoma and colon cancer, which is mismatch repair deficient with huge numbers of mutations. Um, bladder cancer um, uh, has higher mutation load. RCC has lower mutation load, but a pretty good response rate, whereas prostate um, has low mutation load and low levels of response to checkpoint therapy. And so this is a mechanism by which uh, the immune system interacts with the tumor itself, um, allowing for uh, anti, uh, 
uh, response and potentially resistance. Um, so it would be great if uh, checkpoint inhibition cured every patient with cancer, but there are multiple mechanisms of resistance, um, and we need to consider multiple strategies to counter these mechanisms of resistance. Um, we need to tip the balance away from tumor protective mechanisms and towards anti-tumor immunity. Uh, rational combinations are important rather than just throwing the kitchen sink at the problem. Um, we are seeing that some of these combinations are leading to improved survival, um, and we'll, you will be hearing about some of those today. So some possible combinations that are being tested, have been tested, and will be tested are other immune agents, uh, chemotherapy, uh, radiation, anti-angiogenic therapy, and targeted therapies. So in GU cancers, uh, targeting the PD-1, PD-L1 axis clearly has activity. Um, in urothelial cancer, bladder cancer, ureter, and upper tract uh, and renal pelvis carcinoma, five drugs have been approved in the last 18 months. Um, in kidney cancer, uh, nivolumab is FDA approved, and we have evidence of activity of combinations of ipilimumab with nivolumab and atezolizumab and bevacizumab, both of which have led to positive phase three trials. There is some early provocative data with enzalutamide-resistant cancers responding to pembrolizumab in prostate cancer, and there are a lot of trials that are ongoing seeking to change the tumor immune microenvironment in prostate cancer uh, to lead to better responses. And so you're going to hear a lot about each of these uh, areas uh, in the talks tonight. So when we look back over the last 100 years, um, immunotherapy actually began way back in the 1880s, actually back at my home institution, Memorial Sloan Kettering, with William Coley using Coley's toxin, injecting it into tumors and seeing responses. That sort of fell out of favor as radiation and chemotherapy uh, took over and became uh, the more important ways of treating cancer. And it really took a very long time until the next Immunotherapy really uh, came of age, which is BCG in the 1970s for bladder cancer. Um, intravesical therapy uh, started being used in bladder cancer and is still used today and is probably the most potent treatment for non-muscle invasive localized uh, bladder cancer. And since then, we've had a succession, um, a slow succession, I would say, with cytokines in the 80s. And finally, uh, starting in 2011, uh, ipilimumab with CTLA-4. PD-1 inhibitors um, in 2014 with pembrolizumab and nivolumab, 2016 with atezolizumab, 2017 with nivolumab and nivolumab, and now we have multiple other combinations that are showing promise um, that are not yet FDA approved, um, but we're hoping we'll see uh, positive results over the next several years. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this uh, over to Dr. Hammers uh, to talk about kidney cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. So this is a really exciting time, obviously, in um, uh, GU uh, cancers, and in particular, I think, in kidney cancer. These are the approved uh, therapies for renal cell carcinoma, and I can really say that we have come a long way. Um, as you know, uh, kidney cancer is not really sensitive to cytotoxic chemotherapy, has never really played a major role in this disease. And um, uh, until the mid-2000s, we really had very little that worked. Interferon is now regarded as an ineffective therapy uh, for kidney cancer. Yes, high-dose interleukin-2 was approved in 1992, uh, together with melanoma for uh, kidney cancer, and indeed was one of the first um, therapies to really demonstrate that there is a curative potential for patients with kidney cancer when they receive immunotherapy. However, IL-2 was really only available in large academic centers. At the high days of high-dose IL-2, only 2% of patients were really exposed. So the 2000s, um, the vast majority of, of the 2000s until now has really been um, the decade of targeted therapies. Um, so tyrosine kinase inhibitors of the VEGF pathway, so really getting at the Achilles heel of clear cell renal cell carcinoma, which as you know, um, typically suffers from the loss or mutation of VHL, leading to very high expression levels of um, HIF um, uh, transcription factors and VEGF. Really one of the only few tumors where VEGF therapy alone plays a major role. But then in the whirlwind of uh, modern immunotherapy, immune checkpoint inhibitors, Kidney cancer was lucky enough to be regarded as one of the more immunogenic tumors and um, benefited clearly from the early exposure and development of PD-1 targeted therapies, and that led to the approval of nivolumab in 2015. 
And we have another additions to our armamentarium in the TKI landscape. We have now more multi-targeted agents, more broad spectrum agents that we regard as salvage agents, um, as well as some additional combinations. So we will talk about those. Let's start with options for pre-treated patients. So uh, in 2018, until now, really the first-line therapy uh, for most of these patients is a first-line TKI, typically sunitinib or pisorbinib. Cabozentinib has recently been improved, and we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but most patients really get exposure to um, pisorbinib or sunitinib, and then we follow into the um, second-line options, and we will um, talk about some of the data here. So this is a Checkmate 025 study, um, a phase three trial which pitted nivolumab, uh, given at three milligram per kilogram every two weeks against Avrolimus. Um, certainly Avrolimus, the m inhibitor, is uh, the perceived um, uh, weakling among the um, uh, second line or third line options, um, but also a very well tolerated one. So patients were randomized. The primary um, endpoint was fortunately overall survival. Secondary endpoints were PFS um, and the effect of uh, PD1 expression response rate and safety. This is the primary data set, clear cut uh, benefit improvement by five plus months in overall survival with a very good hazard ratio of 0 0.73 and statistically significant. That led to the rapid approval of this agent in renal cell carcinoma in the fall of 2015. This is the breakdown of over survival by subgroup analysis, and this has been often cited, indicating that patients with uh, poor risk may be doing better with overall survival benefit than, for example, patients in favorable intermediate risk groups. Um, in general terms, um, uh, almost all of these um, groups are very well um, leaning or are positioned um, on the side of nivolumab over an mTOR inhibitor. Now, Personally, you know, um, I'm not so sure if, if, um, um, if we can make an argument that PD-1 inhibitors don't work so well uh, as you, uh, in, in good risk disease. As you know, um, um, overall survival is tricky in patients who still take quite some time to actually die. So patients with favorable risk disease do often live for years independent of what you do. Um, and another way to look at it is maybe looking at the response rate. Interestingly, if you look at the response rate, it's actually the same across risk groups. So 24%, 25 and 27%. And remember the patients who do the best and tend to benefit the longest um, from immune checkpoint inhibitors tend to be clustered in the, um, among the responders. So it's not an, un it's, it's not an unrealistic um, agent to be used in favorable risk patients. Overall survival um, was um, looked at in the context of PDL1 expression. And uh, interestingly, while PDL1 expression was a prognostic marker, it was not good enough um, to um, identify uh, patients who will or will not benefit with regards to overall survival as well as response rates. So we don't use PDL1 expression um, uh, with this particular agent. Um, as with uh, most of these agents, um, responses tend to be uh, durable and patients can also continue to respond despite being off therapy, which is depicted in these orange lines uh, where you can see uh, 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 continuous benefit despite being off therapy. The confirmed response rate uh, to nivolumab is 21% um, and the duration of response is 23 months. It's almost uh, two years versus one year for Evrolimus. Again, um, demonstrating that um, the quality of a response might be different with immunotherapy than with targeted therapies. Um, overall, treatment-related adverse events that lead to discontinuation tends to be in the single-digit range across different trials. Um, so around 8% um, in the renal cell carcinoma patient population. And then there is this whole group of what we call treatment-related select AEs. These are immune-mediated um, side effects and certain diagnoses are clustered um, among the organ sites. Um, some of the side effects that we are more concerned about than others are, for example, pulmonary toxicity with pneumonitis that's typically in the single digits, um, but had led to um, death in the development of this agent uh, in the phase one. Nowadays, with well-established uh, treatment algorithms, I think we are all well-versed in um, treating these side effects, but it's important to 
uh, recognize symptoms early and initiate treatment appropriately and timely. What about um, these tumor flares, these pseudo progressions? Um, a lot of things are being um, have been discussed about it and also um, published. Um, yes, um, you can see um, uh, responses after initial progression. That is not a phenomenon that we see with targeted therapy, but it is also a little bit more tricky. Um, so on the left side, you see patients were treated beyond progression. You can see that the target lesions that were followed in some of these patients, there were actually some quite nice responses after the initial um, uh, progression. Um, another graph on the right is a little bit seductive and is very um, important that you look at it the right way. So patients on these trials were offered to continue with the drug and receive treatment beyond progression if they were doing well. Clinical benefit, good performance status, you had to speak prior to a monitor. So these are all um, parameters um, that would identify patients who would do well anyways. Okay, so a patient who actually has symptoms, progressive disease, decline in performance status, these are not patients uh, we believe uh, should be offered treatment beyond progression. So again, these two curves, yes, they separate, but this was not a randomized trial. That's not how it was designed. You just pick patients who do well in general, okay? So we have not necessarily demonstrated that doing treatment beyond progression actually leads to overall survival benefit. This is the Meteor trial. Um, that pitted carbozentinib, a multi-targeted agent, um, also against um, Averolimus. Primary endpoint here was uh, progression-free survival. Secondary endpoint overall survival had an interesting clinical trial design. So the PFS was reported first, followed by the OS uh, benefit. Median progression-free survival was 7.4 months um, for carbozentinib um, versus 3.9 months in Averolimus in patients uh, treated in the second and third or beyond um, line. Most patients were treated uh, in the second line similar to nivolumab. So you see a very nice separation of these curves. And that also resulted in an OS benefit. So one of the few TKI studies that actually ever showed an OS uh, benefit. Uh, median OS was 21.4 months versus 16.5 months for um, Everolimus. Adverse events are, um, as with classic TKIs, diarrhea, fatigue, nausea, hand foot syndrome, hypertension. Um, roughly 60% um, of uh, patients require dose reductions, um, and uh, roughly 12% of patients um, discontinued uh, because of AEs. This particular combination was a little bit of a surprise to me. To be honest with you, I didn't see that coming, which was a combination of a VEGF TKI with Everolimus. The history here is we've tried for years to combine these two, and that was really not successful, but uh, the group at um, Sloan Kettering pulled it off. Um, and this led to this um, relatively small trial, but the data was impressive enough uh, to actually receive FDA approval. So lenvatinib, a multi-targeted um, VEGF TKI targeting also um, FGF, um, in combination with an mTOR inhibitor versus uh, the single agent and versus Everolimus. 153 patients and randomized one to one to one. The primary endpoint was PFS, but they also looked at um, OS despite being a very small and underpowered study. Here, the median PFS was 12.8 months. That's rather impressive. Um, Lembatinib by itself, nine months in Everolimus, um, roughly in the ballpark where we would like, where we typically see it as a single agent, 5.6 months. Response rates um, were. Um, around 20%. Interestingly, there was a median OS benefit, 25 months for the combination versus 18 months and 17.5 months. So a very potent um, a combination that, while it may not be frequently used in the second line, I think in clinical practice, is frequently used as the moment when you think about utilizing an mTOR inhibitor. Remember, these, this class of agent is active by itself, fairly active by itself in 5% of patients. So the moment you think about maybe uh, this class of drug, uh, you may want to think about this particular combination. Side effects, um, as with any of the other TKIs, uh, not much of a difference. So we do have um, good evidence for data for nivolumab, cabozentinib, the combination of lenvatinib and mTOR inhibitor. Um, and um, they have clearly changed the landscape as we currently know it. What about immunotherapy in the front line? 
So as you know, um, big changes are at the horizon, and we will talk about these. Um, this is the immunity, the immunity cycle that Dr. Rosenberg um, just mentioned. I want to position two of the agents I'm going to talk about first in this immunity cycle, PD, PDL1 in the tumor microenvironment, and CTLF4 probably more um, distinctly positioned in um, lymphoid organs, and also an agent that we believe is probably eliminating uh, T regulatory cells to a larger degree. This is the pivotal Checkmate 214 study. The data was presented um, um, by Dr. Escudi at um, ASMO. Um, and this was a combination of nivolumab plus epilimumab at a dosing of 3 milligram per kilogram of nivolumab plus 1 milligram per kilogram of uh, epilimumab given every three weeks for four cycles. Only patients who completed all four cycles were allowed to continue uh, with nivolumab monotherapy. Of note, the epilimumab dose and nivo dose was really the reverse of what we use in melanoma. So lower dose of epilimumab and higher dose of nivolumab. That data set um, uh, uh, came essentially from a prior smaller study that indicated that this particular dosing um, regimen was achieving a similar response rate but with better tolerability. So this was pitted against sunitinib at the classic cycle of four weeks um, on, two weeks off at 50 milligrams. These were treatment-naive pa patients with a clear cell um, component. Importantly, um, this, um, the primary cohort of the study, which was 800 plus patients, focused on intermediate and poor risk patients. So this is roughly 75 to 80 percent of all patients that we treat. Another interesting feature of this trial was the, were the uh, primary endpoints. In fact, you had three co-primary endpoints, something that I had not seen before at this time. Um, so progression-free survival, overall survival, as well as response rate as um, uh, co-primary endpoints, and the alpha had to be split among all three, so making it harder for some of the endpoints to achieve statistical significance. This is the first um, endpoint objective response rate, 42% for nivolumab, epilimumab in intermediate and poor risk uh, patients. That is quite impressive um, versus uh, sunitinib, 27%. Um, Interestingly, we saw a fairly high number of complete responses of 9% in the nivolumab arm versus 1% on the sunitinib arm. The duration of response was 18 months for sunitinib and has not been reached for nivolumab, epilimumab, so again indicating um, that the response on this particular regimen may be of different quality than what you can see with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Um, the other endpoint, progression-free survival, was numerically different with a p-value of uh, 0.03. This would have been satisfying most of us if it was the primary endpoint, but the alpha had to be split, as you remember, um, and this was not enough to achieve statistical significance. However, we believe it's probably clinically relevant, um, and you can certainly see a difference between these two curves. This is the um, probably most important primary endpoint, overall survival. Hazard ratio of 0 0.63, so you can really fit a finger in between those two curves. Very high uh, statistical significance. Um, the median um, uh, overall survival for sunitinib um, was 26 months and has not been reached for nivolumab, epilimumab. Uh, so clearly a very significant finding. And I think that will be difficult uh, to reproduce, I think, with some of the other studies that are following. Um, interestingly, um, this particular study also included 200 patients with favorable risk. Yes, 800 patients were taken to design uh, to look for these um, co-primary endpoints, but they also wanted to see, well, how well does it work in favorable risk patients? In favorable risk patients, the response rate was clearly less, 29%. And it was very high for sunitinib, 52%, um, indicating very VEGF-sensitive disease. Uh, Progression-free survival was not bad. Nivo-IP, 15.3 months, but it was 25 months um, for sunitinib. So here, um, sunitinib beat the Nivo-IP um, uh, combination uh, by regulatory uh, endpoints. 
we will discuss a lot in these kinds of data sets. Does it mean that favorable risk patients are, should not be or are not eligible for immunotherapy? What kind of immunotherapy? Maybe a uh, combination with the VEGF inhibitor could be useful. So there will be lots of discussions, but it's unlikely that the FDA will approve favorable risk patients in the label. The adverse events um, um, uh, is essentially very similar to PD-1 inhibitors, um, except that um, toxicities such as hepatitis, colitis um, are more pronounced. Not all patients were able to receive all four doses. So roughly 20% of patients did not receive all four doses. And roughly 22% of patients had to come off because of treatment-related AEs versus 8% in the single-digit range for uh, nivolumab monotherapy. Now, that does not mean that, do that those patients don't necessarily do well. So some of the patients had toxicities, had to stop therapy, and at least anecdotally, and hopefully we will have more data at some point, is that some of those patients can continue to do well. We also had treatment-related deaths. Seven patients um, out of um, 500 plus on the nivolipi arm and four patients on the sunitinib arm there's a numerical difference, but that was not, not statistically significant. However, um, the side effect profile is accelerated um, when you combine nivolumab and ipilimumab. And as we learn how to uh, use these agents well, um, I think it's important to um, educate physicians, educate patients about the toxicity profile, um, uh, you know, uh, early reporting and the early institution of side effect management. So what I tell my patients is that 60% um, of patients treated with nivolumab pilumumab required systemic corticosteroids. That was the original data that we uh, looked at. And when you drill down a little bit in the steroid range, some of these steroids that patients received were, for example, for allergies, et cetera. If you, if you define it as, let's say, a 40 milligram prednisone equivalent taken for at least two weeks, you will see that the number comes down to 45%, but there's still roughly half of patients. So when I talk to patients about this regimen, I say, well, you know, this is really exciting. The data is really exciting, but you should expect side effects. These are the three or four things that you really need to know about. And I typically describe the symptoms of pneumonitis, hepatitis, colitis, and hypophysitis, but I also tell them there could be all kinds of other side effects that are in the single digit range or less than 1% that you may um, for example, get, you may also get endocrinopathies that are typically um, irreversible, etc. So very important as we um, deploy this kind of treatment um, and the approval can come any time uh, in the community, I think it's really important to focus on these points. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, cabozentinib um, was also studied uh, um, in a cooperative group, a phase two study, smaller number of patients um, that pitted cabozentinib in intermediate and poor risk patients um, against uh, sunitinib, the primary endpoint um, was uh, PFS. Here's some of the data. Um, Progression-free survival by independent um, review um, was 8.6 months versus 5.3 months uh, for sunitinib. That was statistically um, uh, significant. And as you can see by subgroups, um, there was no major difference uh, with regards to um, uh, risk groups, uh, MET status, cabozentinib is a MET inhibitor. Um, and interestingly, it did not matter if you had bone metastases or not, indicating, together with some other data that we have, that this may an agent that is also quite effective in bone metastatic disease. Um, overall survival was not statistically significant, but this study was simply underpowered um, to look at that. The response rate was initially reported by investigator review to be around 46% and 18% for sunitinib. Uh, that was corrected down as the study underwent independent radiographic review, review to a response rate of 20% uh, for carbozentinib and only interestingly 9% um, uh, uh, for sunitinib. Um, so I think there is a sense that maybe uh, for whatever reason sunitinib may have underperformed in the study. However, this was a randomized trial and that's the data as it is. The other question that we have is, you know, as I told you, um, clear cell kidney cancer is defined by um, the high levels of VEGF um, that it utilizes to support and induces vasculature, almost a mindless addiction to this particular pathway. So wouldn't it make sense to combine VEGF inhibitors and PD-1 inhibitors? And besides having an intertumor effect directly, 
if you will, or independent of the immune system, it can also potentially modulate uh, the immune system. It can increase uh, T cell infiltration, it can encourage dendritic cell maturation, for example. Um, so these are um, those um, uh, potential abilities. So um, there's data that was presented last year already from the Motion 150 uh, trial. It was a phase two trial that randomized uh, patients to atezolizumab, sunitinib, and the combination of atezolizumab and bevacizumab. And there was some interesting data um, in the pdl one positive population where the um, progression-free survival was rather impressive. This data set um, was um, uh, important um, and led to a phase three trial that's the Emotion 151 study that um, pitted the combination of atezolizumab bevacizumab against sunitinib and the co-primary endpoints where investigator assessed PFS in patients with pd one expression. Uh, so the median progression-free survival uh, would be reported to be 7.7 months, whereas 11.2 months that was statistically significant um, by investigator uh, review with a response rate that's also um, uh, quite reasonable for these particular combinations. We will have to see how the data falls out and uh, how that is uh, potentially going to influence the first-line treatment. Um, what about very potent VEGF inhibitors? Uh, so bevacizumab is typically an agent that we don't feel is the most um, um, potent um, VEGF inhibitor. Excitinib and other TKIs um, are more um, able to do so. Um, and we have some um, update from a 52-patient uh, um, data set. That's the update from the combination of these um, two agents, which has a rather impressive efficacy. Response rate, 73%. Uh, with an updated PFS of 20.9 months. I would say the most impressive data set that I've seen so far. What does it mean in the long term? How many patients are truly not going to be progressing? How well are patients going to do um, after they progress on this combination? Um, and uh, would that really do, um, is it really a better combination than the sequence of these particular treatments? So these are all questions that we don't have the answer for us yet. But phase three trials are ongoing and will certainly be watched very closely. Excitinib is combinable uh, with uh, PD-1, PD-L1 inhibitors, um, as well as some other TKIs. Um, we've tried that before with sunitinib and pazorpinib, and those agents are generally found to be not combinable. So there's a whole slew of phase, of phase three trials uh, currently ongoing, and you will see a very rapid uh, transformation um, of the first line landscape. I think the first one to come it will be uh, the combination of nivolumab, ipilimumab, probably even in the next few weeks. One word on adjuvant immunotherapy. Um, so as you know, sunitinib is approved now in the adjuvant space. I'm not sure that everybody is convinced that this is um, real progress. Um, there was a disease-free survival benefit, but no overall survival benefit yet at this time. Certainly, we are all excited about um, uh, the PD-1 inhibitors um, in this space. And you can see there's a multitude of trials that uses mostly uh, monotherapy, but also combination therapy in this space. Uh, one trial looks at the role of uh, neoadjuvant exposure prior to the removal of the tumor, whereas other um, uh, agents are purely in the adjuvant space. So certainly, if you have a patient, in particular with T3, T4 disease, please consider enrolling them on these trials. These are very important trials to be conducted and could be a real progress in the management of renal cell carcinoma. So um, now I actually want to um, you know, put a face, if you will, um, to one of the patients who we treated with immunotherapy. So the patient I'm going to talk about um, is a 48-year-old uh, young man, actually uh, somebody who um, is very um, involved in the media world in the area where I practice, um, who is um, a uh, well-educated reporter, um, uh, no major past medical history, um, who just had some history of um, nephrolithiasis, who developed um, hematuria towards the end of the summer um, of last year. Um, he had some uh, work up after he had persistent hematuria, and that showed something like this. So on the left side, you see a CT scan with a very large right-sided mass, not well differentiated without the use of um, well-done contrast. But on the right side, you can see an MRI study. You'll see the heterogeneous uh, kidney mass and the tumor thrombus that are going through the renal vein um, close to the IVC, actually a little bit 
uh, invading into the um, IVC uh, space. At the same time, he had very large liver metastases. You can see that on the left side a little bit um, on the CAT scan, but you can see that much better on the MRI on the right with two very large lesions um, in the liver. He had some more lymphadenopathy, um, and the surgeon felt, well, maybe this is not the best patient to do cytoreductive nephrectomy on, so he was sent to medical oncology. So this was a very nervous young guy um, with um, little kids, um, scared to death, unfortunately, um, as everybody would be, um, and um, inquired about treatment options. Um, we talked to him about the standard of care, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, but he wanted um, some more. He was also worried about some of the side effects. He is exposed to media. The way he looked was very important to him, um, and he didn't want to um, develop some of the TKI-related phenotypic changes, um, white hair, gray, gray hair, um, discoloration, things of that nature. Fortunately, we had a clinical trial, and so we um, offered him um, the volumab, uh, epilimumab in the context of a clinical trial. He did really well uh, with the um, administration of the um, first two doses of nivolumab epilimumab that was given at 3 milligram nivo and epilimumab 1 milligram per kilogram. With the first infusion, he had um, actually quite some fever, 102 for the first day or two, uh, treated conservatively with NSAIDs, uh, went away, uh, was, uh, was otherwise uh, feeling well. So you got these two uh, um, administrations. And after six weeks, um, we also did a scan. And he had a very nice initial response. As you can see now on the left, uh, that these enhancing lesions have now dramatically decreased in size. Um, they become actually uh, quite hypodense. Um, the tumor on the right, the primary tumor was roughly stable. There was a little bit of shrinkage in some of the lymph nodes, um, but in the liver, a rather uh, impressive early response. Um, remember that on the Checkmate 214 study, the first time we looked at these tumors was 12 weeks. So this was um, a different kind of study, early scan, often leads to many discussions, but this one was quite, quite impressive. We were like, wow, this is great. We were like, high-fiving, then the creatinine came back. And the creatinine uh, was now between um, 2.4 and 2.8. Still officially a grade 2, but rather impressive. So what would you do? You just watch it, see if it goes down. Is it dehydrated? Um, probably not. Um, he was doing well overall, no sign of dehydration. Um, we don't think there was contrast nephropathy. Contrast nephropathy is really not very common anymore these days. So we started him on steroids. Big guy, 100 kilogram man. Uh, we, started, we started him on a high dose of steroids to get it under control very quickly. 100 milligrams by mouth twice a day. It's a huge dose. Check the week later. Normal range, roughly the same baseline as where he was before. So we were like, relaxed. Well, this is good. Steroids work right away. Came down very nicely. OK, now we can start a taper. Let's go to a more reasonable dose, 100 milligrams once a day. It's still a high dose of steroids, but something that you can taper down now over your four to six weeks that you're supposed to taper these kinds of uh, medications. So we started the taper, and unfortunately, while on the taper, coming down to prednisone of 60 milligrams per day, still a very high dose, um, we saw again a rise in the creatinine. So what would you do next? Go back to 200 of prednisone. How long do you want to do that? Remember, you don't want to change his face, right? You don't want to change him uh, into somebody who's overt cushion guard features. You don't want to cause myopathy. Uh, you want to avoid some of these, uh, these side effects. Steroids for a short time are fine, but Having somebody walk around on high dose of steroids for a longer period of time is quite dramatic. So we thought we want to add a steroid sparing agent. So we added, we added mycophenolate, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. And we had some effect on the creatinine. So it came down, but as you can see, it never really came down to the baseline. 
And then um, there was a slight trend upwards. Little bit, little bit, continues to go up. Patient got nervous. What are we going to do now? So at that time, he was at 30 milligram of prednisone per day. Still a good dose. So we said, well, you know, this is a 100 kilogram man. So why don't we give him a little bit more mycophenolate? Because you can actually give up to 1,500 milligrams twice a day. So that's what we did. 1,500 milligrams twice a day. And then the levels came back down, trended down, in fact. And then he came for follow-up. And then we saw this blip. What would you do now? Sits in your office, he's like in tears, we can't get this under control, it's a disaster. I said, you know, this just doesn't make no sense. I don't know what's going on, it just makes no sense. So we did nothing. And the next week was fine. So there was no trend, no continuous trend, it was slowly inching up. In fact, it was going down, all of a sudden there was a blip, it made no sense. So we just sat tight and we continued with the taper. He's now off steroids altogether, and he's now coming off mycophenolate. Um, so he avoided major steroid toxicity, um, and he has virtually currently no side effects from any steroids. He's doing well. Importantly, what about the 12-week scan? So remember, this is a time when this gentleman is, is severely immunocompromised. He's on Bectrim for um, a PCP prophylaxis, but his scans continue to improve quite impressively in the liver, primary tumor, lymph nodes, etc. So he's doing really well. Now, what would you do next? Would you re-challenge him? Remember, he was corticosteroid refractory. Um, would you just sit tight? Would you surgically consolidate? I don't know yet, so we'll find out. <laughs> Good. With this, I will turn over Dr. Rosenberg. Great. So, um, maybe we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions. So, what would you do? Would you re-challenge that guy? Um, what did you do? So, I haven't done it yet. I'm still thinking about it. But to be honest with you, I don't think I will re-challenge him. Um, at least not yet at this time. So I don't say never, never, but um, you know, we needed to add a steroid, corticosteroid sparing agent. Um, it was at a fairly um, a high dose. Um, and I would sit tight, I would say, over the next couple of months, and then I would maybe convince myself to do surgical consolidation, take the primary tumor out, lymph nodes, see with an MRI, is there anything active in the liver? and do surgical consolidation in a 48-year-old guy who has a tremendous response um, otherwise. Would you think about resuming single-agent nivolumab as opposed to doublet therapy? Yeah, I would not go back to the doublet. I, I, may, I may consider monotherapy, but uh, um, I'm not sure if I want to do that yet. Great. All right, so I'm going to um, shift gears a little bit and talk about um, where we are and where we're going in bladder cancer, uh, talking about optimal decision-making in a new era um, of bladder cancer treatment. So uh, there's been very little movement for many, many years in bladder cancer. It's starting uh, back in the 1970s, cisplatin was approved, BCG, even though it was used since the 70s, wasn't approved until the late 90s, along with valrubicin. Um, vinflunine is available in Europe. It's a vinca alkaloid that is uh, used in second line uh, therapy for metastatic disease, but really nothing new in the United States until 2016 when atezolizumab was approved. And then in 2017, we saw the approval of four uh, drugs, nivolumab, dervalumab, avelumab, and pembrolizumab. Uh, so now we have a wide variety of uh, uh, arrows in our quiver, although many of them uh, do very similar things. So before 2016, uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy for metastatic disease was really the only option. We had no other useful choices. And cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy was the standard for eligible patients. And carboplatin-based chemotherapy was something that was uh, associated with relatively poor outcomes, in part because the patients um, were not as healthy, and in part because the drug probably isn't as good as cisplatin. And then once people failed, there really was not anything that we were able to do for them. And so, as I said, we've had five drugs approved within 13 months. Um, atezolizumab, nivolumab, devalumab, avalumab, and pembrolizumab, all these uh, PD-1, PD-L1 targeted antibodies. So the current approvals um, are uh, 
Uh, in the frontline setting, um, patients who are cisplatin ineligible, um, both atezolizumab and pembrolizumab are FDA approved. Um, and pembrolizumab has full approval in the second line postplatinum setting based on the results of a randomized phase three study, and we'll go through some of that data. The other four agents in the postplatinum setting all have accelerated approvals based on the promise of future phase three trials. So Keynote 45 led to the full approval of pembrolizumab for metastatic bladder cancer. Um, this slide shows the schema. Patients were randomized to pembrolizumab monotherapy um, or paclitaxel, docetaxel, or vinflunine, dealer's choice, 270 patients roughly in each arm. Um, patients all had to have had prior platinum-based chemotherapy, either one or two lines of treatment, um, and uh, stratified based on known prognostic factors in bladder cancer, um, but not stratified based on pdl one staining, um, which we will see in some other trials. And so the primary endpoint was overall survival. So the results um, show that pembrolizumab, in fact, does improve survival um, in the second or third line. Uh, the median OS uh, and the updated data was 10.3 months for pembrolizumab versus 7.3 months uh, with uh, second or third line chemotherapy. Um, the hazard ratio is 0.7, um, so this is a real difference. Uh, the progression-free survival with uh, either chemotherapy or immunotherapy was short on the order of about two months. Um, and it's really not different between the arms and wasn't a useful endpoint. Um, and in fact, you can see on the bottom curve, uh, the curves kind of dance with each other, um, and so there's no uh, real uh, evidence that uh, PFS is a useful endpoint in this study. Pembrolizumab had a higher objective response rate, 21% um, versus 11.4% um, for chemotherapy. Um, and in high pdl one expressing tumors, uh, pembrolizumab also had a 21% response rate, although interestingly the chemotherapy response rate was lower. And so um, they, the, not only was survival better, but um, the response rate to second-line therapy was better. Um, a second study uh, led to the approval uh, of uh, atezolizumab. Um, this is Invigor 210. Uh, this is a two-cohort single-arm study, um, and we're going to talk first about cohort two. So all these patients had um, locally advanced or metastatic urothelial cancer, and in cohort two, they also had prior platinum therapy. They did not limit the number of lines of therapy. Um, and uh, objective response was the primary endpoint um, based on central review um, as well as investigator assessed um, with uh, multiple expected secondary endpoints. And what we saw in this trial is that a lot of these patients were very heavily pretreated. Um, the response rate was 14.8% uh, was um, in this pretreated population, and the median survival was about eight months, although the toxicity was quite modest. Um, and about a third of patients really had very little or no toxicity attributable to treatment, which is very different than second or third line chemotherapy in this patient population. And we see on the top uh, spaghetti plot individual patient tumors um, and disease burden represented by each line on the tracing, showing that patients um, who had uh, in particular, high levels of pdl one expression on their tumor had dramatic and durable remissions. Um, you see a little bit less of that, and um, you see patients also who had stable disease with high levels of pdl one expression also had um, prolonged stability. Um, and even some patients with progression as their best response still had some, uh, some decrease uh, in uh, tumor burden over time, interestingly enough. So the higher levels of pdl one staining were associated with higher levels of response. This is using the SP142 assay, which really only looks at immune cells as a way of determining whether or not uh, pdl one levels of expression are high. Tumor cells are there and they can stain, but they don't seem to discriminate. It's not that it doesn't stain tumor cells, but pdl one and immune cells is thought to be a better indicator. And on the bottom right, you see this uh, survival curves broken down by pdl one staining. These are not randomized curves. These are uh, high levels, intermediate levels, and low levels. And so if you had high levels of pdl one staining on immune cells, your median survival was longer compared to if you had lower levels. Um, and the response rates were higher in the higher level. This was attempted to be confirmed in a randomized phase three trial. Um, this is in Vigor 211, and this was reported last year at a meeting in Europe um, where patients um, in a similar fashion were randomized to atezolizumab or dealer's choice chemotherapy with vinflunine 
paclitaxel or docetaxel. And the primary endpoint of the study, importantly, was a biomarker selected population. So they looked at PDL1 testing um, with this SP142 assay on immune cells. And the endpoint was OS in high levels of expression of PDL1. Um, atezolizumab in this study did not improve OS in the PDL1 positive population. Um, in fact, interestingly enough, high levels of PDL1 expression seem to predict for both benefit from chemotherapy and atezolizumab, in that the overall survival from chemotherapy, the median was 10 months, um, which is uh, significantly superior than what was seen in, in uh, the previous trial that I talked about, uh, Keynote 45, with a uh, not quite identical but similar design. Um, NPFS also was not significantly improved. The hazard ratio was 1.01. So um, it failed. And the way the study was designed was that if you did not hit the primary endpoint for on the PDL1 positive population, you stopped. You didn't stati formally statistically test the rest of the population. It's a negative study. However, um, they did show that if you look at the entire study population, it looked like atezolizumab did somewhat better. Um, the hazard ratio was 0.85. The 95% confidence intervals don't cross one. However, um, this is not really a legitimate analysis to say the drug is better, but suggests that you know, if they hadn't put their hat on the biomarker, they might have actually, uh, they may not have had a positive trial, but it certainly um, would have had a very different outcome. Um, interestingly, though, and supportive of the data that we'd seen in Invigor 210, uh, the, the duration of response was dramatically longer if you got a tezolizumab, and the response rates and the clinical activity of the drug of a tezolizumab in, in Vigor 211 looked very similar to that in Invigor 210. So I think one interesting analysis: if you look at the type of chemotherapy given, um, the outcomes actually are quite different. So in patients randomized against taxane, um, a tezolizumab did quite well, and in fact, you look at the hazard ratio. Um, it's 0.73, which is very similar to what you'd expect with pembrolizumab. But if you look at the ITT population treated with vinflunine, um, vinflunine performed better than vinflunine's ever performed um, in any clinical trial ever, with a hazard ratio of 0.97 with a median survival that is uh, essentially identical to atezolizumab. Um, and so for some, for some reason, the vinflunine arm overperformed. The trial over accrued vinflunine patients. But regardless, it's a negative study. Um, and so atezolizumab still is on the market because there are multiple other uh, trials that are looking at OS um, and uh, to determine whether or not, and the FDA has elected not to take it off the market. Um, and clearly it's an active drug in a subset of patients. Um, so I think what we can conclude is that vinflunine is more active than we thought perhaps. Atezolizumab really looked very similar to Invigor 210, which is the data that the FDA approved the drug on. This SP142 biomarker did not perform as predicted as it predicted both chemotherapy and immunotherapy response. At this time in the second line setting, level one evidence of a randomized phase three trial, Keynote 45, supports pembrolizumab as the standard second line therapy. There are for that option, and we'll talk about the, uh, some of the other options as well. Checkmate 275 is a single arm open label phase two study that was uh, performed, enrolled um, uh, and 270 patients um, treated with nivolumab, three milligrams per kilogram every two weeks, and patients were treated until progression or unacceptable toxicity. So this study was um, similar in concept to Invigor 210, a large single arm phase two study, um, potentially supporting approval of a drug in patients with an unmet need. So these are the overall survival curves. So for all patients treated with nivolumab on the single arm study, uh, median survival was 8.74 months. Using a PDL1 biomarker staining tumor cells, um, PDL1 expression greater than or equal to 1% was associated with a longer survival, 11.3 months, compared to PDL1 expression on less than 1% of tumor cells, 5.95 uh, months was the median OS. So a big delta between PDL1 positive and PDL1 negative in the study, but again, a single arm study. Um, really cannot tell if this is predictive or prognostic. Um, and so uh, we're sort of, we, we don't use this as, a, as an endpoint of interest. And when we look at toxicity from Checkmate 275, we see that uh, the adverse event rates um, are low overall in terms of grade three um, and no grade four adverse events were reported. Um, this was published in the Lancet la uh, last year. The ad rate of adverse events uh, that are severe was in the range of 5% or less. 
Um, and when we look at these immune-related events, things that have a potential immune-related etiology, severe adverse event rates were also quite low, at 2% or less um, in this uh, clinical trial, with moderate rates of low-grade toxicities. There weren't any grade four events on this study. Um, there were three grade five events, however, three deaths. One was pneumonitis, one was respiratory failure, and another was cardiovascular failure. Presumably all involved um, cardiorespiratory problems. Um, so, you know, you do have to remember that these drugs occasionally can have very, very severe side effects. So, thinking about combinations and how we might improve outcomes, uh, Checkmate 32 is a phase two study testing nivolumab, um, three megs per kg every two weeks, or two dose combinations of nivolumab and ipilimumab in patients who had, had previously treated uh, metastatic urethelial cancer uh, who had had prior platinum. And this was done to try to understand, is there a dose effect of uh, IPI and NEVO in this patient population? All patients then were treated um, with three milligrams per kilogram of nivolumab as maintenance um, after completion of IPI-NEVO. And in this study, um, it was very interesting. The nivolumab monotherapy, a 24% response rate as opposed to a 20% response rate with uh, Checkmate 275. Um, so, you know, relatively similar. Um, but when you use nivolumab 3 mg per kg and ipilimumab 1 mg per kg, the response rate is 26%. So you really haven't gained anything in terms of objective response rates. Um, but if you use nivolumab uh, 1 mg per kg and ipi 3 mg per kg, so higher dose ipilimumab, the response rate in that smaller cohort was 38.5%. So this data is being confirmed in a much larger trial um, and a uh, much larger cohort. It's important to remember this was not a randomized trial, and so you can't really conclude very much. I think this is hypothesis generating, but does in fact suggest that uh, three, IP3 and EVO1 might have additive activity. So we see that these uh, CTLA-4 PD-1 combinations in bladder cancer might hold some promise. Um, we've heard about some about the toxicity, um, which can be significant. Um, the toxicity profile seems similar uh, between, the different, uh, between all the different diseases. What we hope to find is agents that have less toxicity in combination with PD-1, PD-L1 inhibition. Um, and frankly, bladder cancer patients often are older and sicker than kidney cancer patients are and may not tolerate. Um, highly toxic uh, regimens of immunotherapy. And so one very attractive and interesting pathway um, is the indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase pathway. So this activity, this enzyme, uh, depletes tryptophan in the tumor microenvironment and increases kynurenine levels. And kynurenine is an immunosuppressive amino acid that decreases T effector cell function, leads to differentiation and activation of regulatory T cells, and therefore creates a very unfriendly tumor microenvironment. And so two inhibitors of this pathway have moved into more advanced testing um, after showing some very promising phase two data, and I'll show you that um, in a minute. So epicatastat is one of these drugs. Epicatastat is an IDO inhibitor combined with pembrolizumab in a, an expansion cohort on a phase 1b trial of the combination in urothelial cancer. And they treated 40 patients. Now remember the, com the Response rate to pembrolizumab as a single agent in this patient population is about 20, 21 percent. So they observed a 35 percent objective response rate. And interestingly, except for perhaps more rash, the tolerability was very similar to PD-1 therapy by itself, um, suggesting that this is really something we need to investigate further. And there are large randomized trials that are um, launching or launched um, in metastatic bladder cancer comparing pembrolizumab epicatastat to pembrolizumab alone. Um, so this is a drug to keep an eye on. Similarly, nivolumab has been tested in combination with uh, BMS 986205 or 205 in a small expansion cohort, 25 bladder cancer patients in a multi-cohort phase 1-2 dose escalation study. And in this small cohort, um, the response rate to the combination was 32 percent. Single agent therapy, you'd expect it to be around 20 uh, to 20, uh, maybe 24 percent, but probably more like 20 percent. Um, and interestingly, this drug decreased kynurenine levels within the tumors. So they were able to show that if you give this drug, you change what's happening in the tumor microenvironment, not just in the blood. Um, and so showing that there is a pharmacodynamic effect consistent with the mechanism of action. And, and the toxicity also seems single, similar to single agent therapy. 
And so this is moving forward as well. So these drugs are acting in the tumor microenvironment to allow T cells that infiltrate into the tumor to actually carry out their activities, not otherwise suppressed um, by this unfavorable tumor microenvironment. So first line immune checkpoint blockade has also uh, come to urothelial cancer and is quite an important um, area to know about. Um, so in Vigor 210, this two cohort study, the uh, cohort one were patients who were ineligible for cisplatin. Um, these patients are people with uh, uh, impaired performance status and or cisplatin ineligibility based on PS2, hearing loss, or renal impairment. And the primary endpoint of the study was uh, response rate um, with secondary endpoints of overall survival and duration of response. It was a modest size uh, cohort, 119 patients. And um, the take home points in terms of this group of patients on this trial is that 21% of patients were over 80. That's really not something we had seen in bladder cancer trials before. Most of the patients were in the 70s or 60s. 70% 70 of patients had renal impairment and wouldn't have, would not be eligible for cisplatin by conventional criteria. 20% were poor performance status, and two-thirds of patients had visceral metastases. And what they sh uh, showed was that the overall response rate for all patients was 23%, including 9% of patients with complete responses. That's about the complete response rate you'd expect with cisplatin. Um, it's not something we'd seen before with a not anything without cisplatin. And the median survival on this trial in this cohort was 15.9 months. To refresh your memory, the median survival of cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy in cisplatin-eligible patients is 14 months. So in a relatively small study, it really suggested that this, uh, as a single agent in the frontline setting, um, this drug led to uh, durable responses. The median duration response is still not yet reached. I still have to have the trial ongoing at my institution because we're still waiting to find out how long the responses last. The toxicity profile is similar to the other agents, really relatively well tolerated. The rates of immune-related adverse events were all essentially under 5% um, in that range, um, and the rates of grade 3, 4 toxicities for each individual toxicity were very low, 3% or less. Keynote 52 is the other study that led to FDA approval in the first-line setting as an accelerated approval with 350 patients, so a much larger study. Very similar eligibility criteria, poor performance status, impaired creatinine, neuropathy or hearing loss, and they also added heart failure as a criteria. Primary endpoint was overall response in all patients and also looked at overall response in pdl one positive tumors. So this patient population is actually um, probably somewhat older and sicker than the atezolizumab study. 42% of patients had impaired performance status, PS2. Almost 50% were over age uh, 75. 85% of them had visceral mets, and about 50% had renal impairment as the reason for cisplatin ineligibility. So more renal impairment, more PS2. And the response rate in all patients in the study was 24%, included 5% of patients with CRs. Um, if you look at the patients who were enrolled um, at least four months before the data cut, the response rate was higher. So the study isn't as mature, the data is not as mature, and we'll eventually hear some updated data, including survival presumably at upcoming meetings. Uh, but this data with responses that appeared durable led to the FDA approval. And we see here on the swimmers plot that uh, on the top right, that patients um, who went on the study who experienced responses, uh, the responses happened quickly at around eight to 10 weeks, that uh, the responses in general were durable um, for those patients who had responses. But it's also interesting to see the little triangles that uh, are scattered throughout the the swimmer's plots, there are patients who have delayed responses, and there are some responses that are slower. And in fact, the majority of patients had uh, uh, tumor reductions um, on this trial. So highly active agent, um, the mature data are awaited. Tolerability was generally uh, very similar to the other uh, agents that we've talked about. Fatigue was the most common, it was pretty mild. Um, and the grade three toxicities were quite rare, and there wasn't any single type of event that predominated other than the fact that some of them were immune-mediated, and um, that was the common thread. There was one death reported on the study related to a myositis and myocarditis, along with hepatitis, so a sort of fulminant immune activation syndrome. So we now have a new standard of care for patients who are cisplatin ineligible, um, with uh, mature OS data for the atezolizumab cohort at 15.9 months.
um, and a response rate of 23.5 percent. And with pembrolizumab in Keynote 52, the updated data with a 29 percent objective response rate in the most recent presentation, um, including a 7 percent uh, CR rate. The OS data is immature. It seems like the staining that they that this study is doing with PDL1 might lead to a better um, might be associated with better outcomes, but I think that needs to be fully validated. Um, and the drug is now is available for use uh, for a little under a year. Um, and there are multiple uh, trials in the frontline setting that are currently ongoing. Try to further flesh out um, how can we use these drugs in untreated patients. So there are actually four large randomized phase three studies that are either ongoing or completed accrual and maturing. Um, one each with uh, a nivolumab or nivolumab ipilimumab combination, a pembrolizumab or pembrolizumab combination, a tezolizumab or a tezolizumab combination, or devalumab and tremi or devalumab. And they're all very similar in their uh, patient populations. Um, and so uh, we're looking forward to completing accrual on three of these trials and seeing the results um, from all of them. So the question that comes up is, can we incorporate these agents into earlier stages of disease? So patients with muscle invasive bladder cancer, it's a potentially lethal illness, but it isn't necessarily a lethal illness. And so standard of care today remains cisplatin-based combination chemotherapy. But we know that a lot of patients can't tolerate this. We also know that many patients who have neoadjuvant chemotherapy have persistent invasive and aggressive disease um, at the time of surgery. So even though you got chemotherapy, it didn't really help that much and uh, there are no standard options. So there are currently three ongoing adjuvant phase three trials uh, with muscle invasive or node positive disease um, at cystectomy. Um, Invigor 010 is comparing atezolizumab to observation. Checkmate 274 is nivolumab to placebo. And pembrolizumab versus observation is the Alliance 31501. Um, and if you have access to these trials, I encourage you to enroll patients because we need to answer these questions. We've had very difficult times completing adjuvant trials in bladder cancer. So there are a lot of clinical trials now in bladder cancer. There's probably almost as many slots as there are patients, it feels like at times. Um, lots of immune-immune combinations are being tested, both in the neoadjuvant and metastatic disease setting, including vaccines, as well as uh, combinations of uh, uh, IDO inhibitors, other checkpoints, et cetera. Um, and there are multiple clinical trials looking at combinations with chemotherapy because we know chemotherapy works in this disease. Um, and then there are also combinations of targeted agents plus chemotherapy. So some of the questions that were talked about earlier around renal cell carcinoma with anti-VEGF, um, agents with uh, HDAC inhibitors, with uh, BTK inhibitors are all being looked at um, in bladder cancer in multiple clinical trials. So this is sort of a summary slide of how we should treat bladder cancer today. So will probably change in about six months, but for now, uh, for people who are cisplatin eligible, they should get cisplatin-based chemotherapy if they have metastatic disease. If they're cisplatin ineligible, you have two checkpoint inhibitors or chemotherapy, and there are some patients where chemotherapy makes some sense. And if they're um, metastatic relapsed um, after platinum-based chemotherapy, pembrolizumab has level one evidence with four other options you can choose from in the United States. And we're not 100% sure what to do with these folks who had um, had uh, chemotherapy and immunotherapy, um, they should probably be getting cytotoxics um, or going on clinical trials. Um, and in fact, clinical trials are good options throughout the disease spectrum. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a patient of mine. So this is um, a 71-year-old gentleman who had a decades-long history of urothelial cancer. Started with um, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, had his bladder eventually removed for refractory uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, eventually needed a urethrectomy and a nephrectomy, has one kidney and one ureter, reasonable renal function, develops metastatic uh, cancer, biopsy proven uh, with uh, urothelial cancer to lymph nodes um, and also lung nodules, um, was treated with gemcitabine and carboplatin, had progression, um, and so he went on a trial with nivolumab as single agent. Um, and he, um, and we see here on the top that pretreatment, he had an enlarging lymph node about a centimeter and a half. This is representative of his disease. It's relatively low volume. Um, after three cycles of anti-PD-1 therapy, uh, essentially no big change. You can see that node hasn't really done much. But after nine months of treatment, he actually starts to progress. This node is actually increasing in size. Um, and he um, feels well, has no real side effects, feels pretty good. It's like, you know, doc, this stuff may or may not be working, but my quality of life is really good, so let's continue.
So we continued treatment, and after six months of therapy, that lymph node totally disappeared, an additional six months of treatment. So this is an unusual case of pseudoprogression. You heard about pseudoprogression before, where you can get early enlargement of tumors. Um, this is an unusual case where a patient who has been on long-term therapy for quite a while um, has some slow growth of his tumor, and then suddenly it shrinks. Um, the patient felt well. It's always a question in the oncology community, how, you know, with this possible phenomenon of pseudoprogression, which I think really does occur in a small number of patients, how do you sort of distinguish? And my general answer is if the patient feels well, it's probably worth continuing a little longer and seeing what happens. But if the patient feels poorly, has cancer-related symptoms, it's probably the cancer growing and it's not pseudoprogression and, you know, we shouldn't um, try to continue treatment. Um, uh, in, that, in that scenario. So this guy continued therapy and is now, I believe, a year and a half further into it, two and a half years of treatment. And he started to notice some mild dyspnea, getting out of breath. Um, we held his uh, a checkpoint inhibitor and there were scattered patchy areas of uh, relatively mild amounts, small amounts of infl inflammatory infiltrates that were observed. No fevers, no signs of infection. Um, so we held therapy and waited for a few weeks. Um, this is just a representative image. That's just one area, but that's not the only area on his scan. And so, in fact, for grade one, very mild cases, um, you can actually just hold therapy for a few weeks, re-image patients. Um, he felt better. A little bit of dyspnea went away. CT um, showed essentially a res resolution of all the inflammation, and he successfully resumed anti-PD-1 treatment. He's actually still on treatment today, about a year later. Um, doing spectacularly well um, with really no other side effects. So just a, a little bit of more about immune-related adverse events. We talked a little bit about uh, the uh, renal uh, issues. It can affect essentially any organ in the body, and it's important to remember this when you're taking care of patients. These are very challenging patients from an internal medicine perspective because you have to think about every possible possibility that could be occurring with the patient um, because weird things do happen. Um, endocrine disorders, respiratory disorders, gastrointestinal disorders, neuromuscular disorders, skin disorders, hepatic disorders, I can go on. Um, it really is quite, a, quite an array. The severe pneumonitis tends to occur early in the course of treatment. It generally is not a late event to have severe disease. But as you can see, late pneumonitis does in fact occur and can occur with reasonable frequency. Um, and so it is something to keep in mind as your patients are on long-term therapy. Um, but it really is rare to get severe disease late in the course of the illness. For patients with high-grade pneumonitis, obviously steroids um, are critical. Early recognition, pulmonary evaluation um, is important and tend to present with dyspnea and or cough. Um, fevers are relatively uncommon. Um, and sometimes their findings can be pretty subtle. For example, that patient, I bet if we had just continued his immunotherapy and not thought about um, pneumonitis, we might have ended up in big trouble with him. Um, it's, the frequency is much more common with CTLA-4 antibodies than with PD-1, um, and uh, the severe adverse event rate with pneumonitis is low, um, but it's reproducible and detectable in multiple trials. Um, so the key is early diagnosis and initiation of corticosteroids for patients who are symptomatic, um, and even admission to the hospital, certainly for um, higher grade toxicities. Um, and this needs to be tapered over a long period of time, and it's good to work closely with pulmonary if you have a grade four life-threatening event, um, I would not personally bother re-challenging the patient because I think you're gonna hurt them ultimately, um, but we do sometimes re-challenge in grade three situations. So just rather than getting into the individual details of every possible immune-related adverse event, I think a sort of guideline, a good rule of thumb. Um, if we're grade one uh, toxicities with single agent PD-1, pd one therapy, usually you continue treatment, treat symptomatically, um, monitor carefully if it's lab-based abnormalities to make sure that it, things aren't going south. If it gets worse, if it's grade two, you probably hold things, hold your immunotherapy treatment. If they're not getting better, you should use corticosteroids, probably intermediate dose, um, as listed here, and then taper over about a month, and then decide if you want to re-challenge if they've resolved. For severe and life-threatening toxicities, you stop treatment, you give high-dose corticosteroids, um, and you might hospitalize them, depending on what it is. Um, and we often need to occasionally go, we occasionally need to go to these other immunosuppressants like mucophenolate or infliximab um, in order to get control of these adverse events. So the timing is relatively stereotyped. It's not um, inherently uh, uh, stereotyped. So 
The common events, uh, the GI events, um, you can see on the top graph, um, occur pretty quickly, usually before three months. Whereas the skin events um, can occur any time after the first few weeks um, and continue on throughout treatment um, as, uh, as potential adverse events. Um, in terms of other toxicities, pulmonary, uh, hepatic, and renal, some of them occur much later. And the endocrine events can occur throughout the course but peak around 30 weeks. And this is data um, with uh, checkpoint inhibition in melanoma but the toxicity spectrum is relatively similar. So one of the things that I always remember is that autoimmune uh, endocrinopathies can have presented any time um, during the course of the disease and that you have to think about these. And so fatigue requires investigation of thyroid, adrenal, and pancreatic function. Um, so we ran running a little bit over, um, but uh, there probably are a few questions for a couple of minutes um, that we can do before we move to prostate cancer. So. Um, So one question is, which agents in the second line show the best response after checkpoint in frontline cis-ineligible patients? So this question, I think, is trying to ask, what do you do if you had a frontline cis-ineligible patient and they've progressed? Um, my personal thing, my personal belief is we'd give them chemotherapy um, with whatever agent the patient can tolerate, um, probably gemcitabine and carboplatin um, or another cytotoxic regimen. Um, there, is, uh, there isn't any prospective data. There are some exciting clinical trials going on, specifically in this patient population using non-immunotherapy approaches. And there are some other trials going on using combinations of immune drugs. Um, trying to see what else. So one question that I'd like to pose to you guys, people who are on immunotherapy and doing well, how long do you keep them on? Well, it's a good question, and we don't really know the answer yet. I think, um, I think we have to be cautious at this time and wait for some more data. But I think if you get out, you know, a year, 18 months, I think it's a discussion with the patient a little bit. Yeah, my own opinion is I think it varies by disease, um, and that certain diseases probably require long-term therapy and other diseases may not. And I don't think we have enough information yet to really understand that. Tonight, I'd like to thank my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Hammers and Dr. Rosenberg, for two great talks that really um, highlighted where we are with two important GU cancers. So here we have basically the timeline of therapies for, for prostate cancer uh, emerging in the last uh, five or seven years. We've had multiple therapies. Tucked in here, actually before ipilimumab was approved in melanoma, is an immunotherapy in prostate cancer called CIP-T or cip and I'll come to that in a moment. But the most common question I get is, where's the checkpoint inhibitor data for prostate cancer that's not on that arc that was shown there? It's not really on that arc, it's on the side of a milk carton because it's missing and we're still looking for real data on how to use checkpoint inhibition in prostate cancer. We have had trials, large trials, two studies with ipilimumab or anti-CTLA-4 in post-chemotherapy and pre-chemotherapy metastatic disease um, and unfortunately neither of them hit their overall survival endpoints. There's been multiple small trials with PDL1 or PD1 inhibition in prostate cancer, and they look like a trial that we conducted at the NCI where there's some dips and dunks, but really nothing changes. It is important to remember, though, that there is an indication, as with all cancers, for MS high tumors in prostate cancer, which may make up between 2 and 5% of prostate cancer patients. I think that this is a relevant thing to be testing in advanced prostate cancer patients, also in the context of BRCA or DNA damage repair mutations, which make up about 30% of patients and could result in targetable therapies as well. So evaluating the genetics in advanced prostate cancer is probably increasingly important and is something that should be considered at some point in the disease process. Now there is an FDA approved immunotherapy in prostate cancer and people uh, really uh, are a little reluctant to believe the data, although we have two phase three trials that demonstrate that Cipolucil T, a therapeutic cancer vaccine, does actually improve survival in prostate cancer. The controversy um, from this trial uh, was that basic, basically um, the, there was no short-term disease progression and PSAs don't, didn't drop. On well, prostate cancer, we've been told for almost a decade now that we shouldn't be using PSA as a readout of response, and we just saw curves in bladder cancer where uh, survival curves actually cross. So I think it's interesting. I don't know that the world was ready for immunotherapy when this data came out. So I do think that there is a role for cipolucil T in early metastatic disease for patients who are asymptomatic and probably have low tumor burden, and we could talk a little bit more about that if there's interest during the Q&A. So why does pdl one 
or PD-1 inhibition not work in prostate cancer? And really, it's this cold tumor microenvironment from an immunologic perspective. There are no immune cells there to be unleashed upon the cancer by PD-1 or PD-L1 inhibition. So the strategy that we can employ in prostate cancer that we can also employ, employ in 70 or 80 percent of bladder and renal cancer is how do we get the immune cells to the tumor microenvironment to make PD-1 and PD-L1 inhibition a, a relevant strategy. And there are multiple strategies to get immune cells to the tumor microenvironment, whether it's vaccines, therapeutic cancer vaccines, Treg depletions, which can also be accomplished potentially with ibalumumab, immunocytokines, which is something we haven't talked a lot about in the field yet, but I think in the next few years you'll see that come up a lot. And even some cytotoxic chemotherapies have been shown to enhance immune infiltration of the tumor. Once in the tumor microenvironment, they're likely to uh, see upregulation of the PD-1, PD-01 uh, expression on the immune cells and the tumor cells, making, again, these therapies more relevant. So there are actually a few studies emerging. They're small at this point, but it's promising early days for combination therapy with checkpoint inhibition in prostate cancer. Monotherapy has not been successful, but um, there is data, as was alluded to earlier, that in patients who've already progressed on enzalutamide, we're seeing about a 20% response rate in a small cohort of patients. There is some preclinical data um, done by Jen Jennifer Bishop that shows increased PD-1 expression on immune cells in patients who have been exposed to enzalutamide. And our group at the NCI has demonstrated that enzalutamide actually has its own independent pro-immune effects uh, leading to increases in natural killer cells and decreases in uh, decreased myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Doug McNeil has done some very uh, compelling research at the University of Wisconsin with a DNA-based vaccine therapy. And what he's actually looked at in some elegant studies in combination with pembrolizumab is basically um, taking this vaccine and either giving it sequentially uh, before uh, the, the, the um, the checkpoint inhibition or concurrent. And what he's actually been able to show is that concurrent administration of pembrolizumab in the vaccine results in more frequent uh, responses in the terms of PSA declines, as well as partial responses that he's reported so far. This study is also ongoing, and we look forward for more data. You heard from my colleague at the NCI today uh, about duralumab, a PDL1 inhibitor, and olaparib. Um, you see here, these are the responses in the first 17 patients, not all of which were BRCA confirmed DNA damage repair or BRCA mutants. In fact, about probably three or four, we're still waiting for some confirmation. I think we know for, from analysis that one or two are not at this point. So it's not really clear right now if the duralumab is enhancing uh, DNA damage repair targeting or there's other uh, synergistic properties going on. We'll put another 40 patients on this study and learn more. So I mentioned vaccines as being an option, and we have a trial that's ongoing at the National Cancer Institute as well with a pox viral based vaccine known as PROSFAC. So this basically is an agent that contains a, uh, a virus that contains genetic material for transgenes for a target antigen, in this case PSA, and, and three T-cell costimulatory molecules. It's an off-the-shelf vaccine. Once injected under the skin, the viruses infect the immune cells, leads to the processing of the DNA. Uh, the, PSA is displayed in an immune context with the T-cell costimulatory molecules, leading to T-cell activation and targeted tumor cell destruction. Now, this vaccine on its own has not demonstrated a survival advantage in advanced prostate cancer, but we have an ongoing study looking in the neoadjuvant setting with ipilimumab and nivolumab. In order to prove safety, though, we did a study in metastatic disease just to make sure we weren't going to prevent curative therapy in the neoadjuvant setting. It probably was a good idea we did that. So these are the responses we've seen in the first four patients. Um, you'll notice that we've had some very interesting declines in PSA. Two patients have had 90 or 90 percent declines in, uh, in their PSA. I will tell you that patients one and two were treated with the combination of Prosvac and ipilimumab and nivolumab, but they also both had immune-related adverse events in the form of hemorrhagic cystitis and grade three hepatitis. So we've actually dropped the ipilimumab moving forward. We don't think that we can deploy that in the neoadjuvant setting safely. So we're exploring the combination in patients three and four um, with really just Prosvac and nivolumab, and you see that patient four did have a nice PSA decline. We are also evaluating the MSI status in these patients to make sure that we're not uh, just treating those patients as well, and we'll hopefully have data from the first 12 patients by the time ASCO comes around, but again, possible strategies. And then I'll just end with another strategy for immunotherapy. I think 
All the studies, for the, most, for the most part, the studies that have been done have been done in castration-resistant prostate cancer in men who are on testosterone-lowering therapy. I think it's a broad assumption to assume that uh, the, the immune system of a castrate male is, the same, is equivalent to uh, what it may be in a patient with a normal testosterone. We know testosterone has independent effects on the immune system. So one population that I'm especially interested in looking at is biochemically recurrent prostate cancer. These are men who have a rising PSA and um, after definitive radiation or surgery, but no radiographic evidence on conventional imaging of disease. And so this is the population here, again, rising PSA, CT scan, bone scans negative. These patients also have no symptoms from their disease, and really the only standards of therapy are surveillance, um, which is reasonable if their PSA doubling time is prolonged, or androgen deprivation therapy, which comes with inherent side effects, with mo which most men are looking to avoid. So why is this relevant? Why do, why do I care about this? this? This is gonna change just like everything in prostate cancer as novel molecular imaging comes to uh, the, the fore here. And what we have now is basically prostate cancer under the water that we can't see, the proverbial iceberg, but as we start unleashing PET imaging, we're gonna drop the water line, we're gonna start seeing more of this disease. So hopefully we can have therapies for these men beyond just abiraterone for life or something along those lines. So I currently have a study in collaboration with Sloan Kettering and Dana-Farber where I'm giving PROSVAC, that therapeutic cancer vaccine, for six months in a randomized study. The primary endpoint is actually looking at uh, a comparison between the growth rates between the surveillance group and the vaccine group, but the surveillance group again eventually gets vaccine. The initial hypothesis, again, was that we would slow the growth rate of the cancer with the vaccine therapy. We had seen this retrospectively with Ciblucil T as well as with this vaccine previously. But I'm actually seeing some more interesting results, and that is late declines in, P in a subset of patients. So in order to evaluate this, basically I've defined a, a post hoc term called the interstudy apex PSA, which is basically a PSA that's confirmed by a contiguous value within 10% to avoid lab variations that we all see in our clinics and then observe responses that may be below that threshold subsequently. So I'll share a couple of stories with you. This is a patient, biochemical recurrence. PSA is rising. We all know that this patient's probably getting closer to androgen deprivation therapy. This is pretty typical. You do see some blips here and there, but um, something interesting happened. Now, I think his time on vaccine actually ended in October, um, and you'll actually see that his PSA dropped and stayed low for actually until just recently. We don't normally see this in biochemical recurrent prostate cancer. His testosterone didn't dive. This is actually what you might expect with some anti-androgen therapy. So this was certainly a compelling finding and one of the early hints of this kind of surprising response. Again, we had a patient who came on with a PSA of about four. He got vaccine until uh, really about this time point. And I was, you maybe saw a flattening in the curve, but maybe you were just being optimistic. When he got this value, I said, listen, we screwed up your blood work in the lab. We, we messed it up. I got to send you back there and we'll, we'll recheck it because there's no way that this is right. It stayed pretty low for actually it's still like 0.07 now. I, I don't have a great explanation. We are doing immune analysis on this, but I think this highlights the potential of immunotherapy in this population. So of the first 22 patients that are evaluable, we've seen eight of these type of responses. I've shown you the most dramatic one. Uh, except for one I left out where a patient's PSA climbed from 3 to 18, and months after threatening him with ADT, he was, I think, broken, and I think I was about to give it to him, and his PSA dropped to 7. Um, it's certainly an interesting um, hypothesis now that we can have an immunotherapeutic impact in this population. Now, I'm not telling you that what we need to do in this population is give this vaccine and see modest PSA declines in a subset of patients. What I'm saying is maybe there's a hint that this population may have benefit, and so this trial actually will launch later this month with the safety cohort and then hopefully um, pursue it in biochemical recurrence. If one vaccine works targeting PSA, I'm going to come in with a second vaccine and a CV301. Uh, this targets CEA and MUC1. So we'll evaluate that for four months and see if we can get responses from just that. But then I will come in with a, a pd one uh, inhibitor, uh, basically a velimab that has a TGF beta scavenging. Uh, backbone, or I should say on its uh, FC portion. So basically uh, blocks pd one in the tumor microenvironment and removes TGF beta, which is a uh, immune suppressive cytokine. And the hope is that by bringing all this immuno immunotherapy to the foreign prostate cancer, we can get a greater proportion of responses in the patients that I've showed you, not just eight of 22. We'll also have a cohort, again, in safety of metastatic disease to maybe
get a preliminary signal. So there are exciting studies, I think, going on in prostate cancer. It's a tougher nut to crack right now, but I think we're, we're, we are making progress. Um, I've showed you data from several studies that are, and I think that perhaps moving it earlier doesn't just make sense from a, a, a clinical strategy standpoint. I think it also makes sense from an immune system or immunotherapeutic strategy standpoint. But I thought we'd take a couple of questions that people had. There are some good questions here. So, Hans, in community practice, when you're seeing patients who are not on trial, how often are you doing imaging on someone who's on year one of nivolumab, year two of nivolumab? How often are you following those patients with scans? Um, so, um, outside of a trial, I typically image patients in the range of every two to three months. Yeah, and for me in bladder cancer, I think if they are probably longer than a year, I might do every three to four months. Um, but uh, certainly in the first year, I'm doing every... Th um, I start out every two months because of the aggressiveness of the disease and ultimately space that out to three months and then four months. And there are some patients where I'm doing it every six months if they've been on long term. Um, is MSI a, bio a marker in RCC? Do we see it ever in RCC? Marker, sir? MSI, M MMR deficiency? Uh, no, unfortunately not. Yeah. It is a rare, it's a rare event in bladder cancer. It's much more common in upper tract urothelial cancers. And so it's important to remember that it's a, that upper tract urothelial cancer is a Lynch syndrome cancer. And so any upper tract cancer, you should think about testing for MSI high uh, status. Um, similarly, like you might think about an advanced CRPC because it's actually not a trivial percentage. And in fact, uh, those patients in some data presented at ASCO last year that those patients do very well with immunotherapy as you might expect. Um, and that's part, they're included in the FDA approval for that category. So another good question from the audience. Um, in the nivolumab study, the pre-specified clinical benefit that allowed people to stay on treatment, what, was, what did they actually say? Was it just the doctor's gestalt or was it you know, you stay on if you meet certain criteria? The patient had to have some form of clinical benefit and had to tolerate the therapy. And the, um, in fact, the uh, treating physician had to talk to the monitor and he had approval from the monitor. Um, so this was a clearly selected patient population and um, we cherry picked the best ones who continue on therapy. Uh, so this was by no means a randomized approach. And in the, um, in the bladder cancer atezolizumab trial, for example, there were actual specific criteria for example, no change in performance status, uh, no uh, tumor at critical sites, no hypercalcemia. Um, so there were actually pre-specified criteria in some of the bladder cancer trials. In addition, you had to chat with the medical monitor and let them know why you wanted to do this. Um, and it turns out docs are pretty good at figuring out, I think, who should stay on these treatments, which is, which is in fact, reassuring. Um, so here's a question for you guys. So since pd one Status isn't a good predictor. Tumor mutation burden for some diseases may be better than others. Where do you think we're going for biomarkers? And you don't have, you know, we're not going to hold you to this, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my best guess is it's probably going to be a, a composite of, of different, um, you know, inputs, if you will. So um, uh, mutational burden, PDL1 expression. In kidney cancer, I do think risk factor, in fact, uh, can play a role. So favorable. Uh, seems to be um, more enriched for patients who are VEGF sensitive than, than, um, than um, necessarily PD-1 responsive, or at least PD-1 plus CTLA-4, because the response rate actually to PD-1 alone is 25%. So maybe not the combination, but maybe PD-1 alone. So um, these are the ones that we have now. And then um, after that, I think it's all, it's all fair game. Right. Ravi, what do you think? Yeah, I, I share your, your, your thoughts. I think we have to see the immuno, immunologic force for the trees a little bit. I think the atezolizumab, they tried to call their shot a little bit, and, you know, we saw what happened there. We've seen some compelling data from melanoma, and I think even bladder cancer as well, where, you know, gamma interferon and genes associated with gamma interferon uh, upregulation within the tumor microenvironment, which could be indicative of an immune response has been also uh, a good marker. So I think, I agree, composites that really tell us that is there immune activity that would lead to pdl one expression or immune cells at least present, um, I, I think that's where we're headed with this. Right. Now one thing that's coming in kidney cancer that I forgot to mention is recently actually some data was published uh, from the Dana-Farber group. I think that's very interesting, in fact, that pbr one mutation tumors may be more responsive to immunotherapy. So we will see how that holds up, but I think there was a, some compelling uh, preclinical and clinical data sets. So, so here's a clinical question. So if you have a patient who's doing very well for a long term, who breaks through in one area on immunotherapy, what is, what, how would you manage them? Would you change treatments? Would you um, 
put them on, a, you know, a TKI? Would you in renal cell or give them chemotherapy and bladder? Would we? Would you do radiation? How would you manage sort of that? So, so I spot weld. Um, I, I do consider somebody who has done really well on immunotherapy for a longer period of time, uh, and we see a breakout lead. I consider that as essentially new disease. Um, and I treat it as such. So I use stereotactic radiation, um, less the knife, but probably more stereotactic radiation, and go after those breakout lesions. Um, we've had several patients with some tremendous, tremendous responses, and I think my sense is that the chance to have clones that are going to escape is higher in large tumor burden patients. Um, and it may make sense to really go after those particular lesions. We're also doing some studies where we look at where maybe radiation can enhance de novo immune responses, maybe enhance these immune checkpoint inhibitors, so maybe some of those trials could be useful for those kinds of patients. Right. Yeah, I think we should always acknowledge the potential synergies of sub subsequent ther therapies to really give like another punch to the ongoing immune response. I think there's, especially with some of the vaccine therapies we can use in prostate cancer, you know, you're generating an immune response uh, that potentially could last. I showed you some delayed responses in our patients that seem to be sustained beyond the treatment administration period. I think, um, you know, you just don't want to cling to avoid these therapies later on or to, to your patient's detriment. Great. Very good. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for sticking with us, and I um, hope you enjoyed uh, the talks and uh, learned something. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute, Incorporated, and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerview.com forward slash xzx. This activity is supported through an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb.